in a bit. Um, so the main species of shorebirds I've worked on before are the northern lapwing, which is the shiny looking bird with the crest. Um, when Laura was mentioning my PhD, that was the red shank. So that's the one standing in the mud with orange legs. And then more recently, I've worked for the uh, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds back in the UK and Scotland. And I worked on these golden plovers in a wind farm. So I was looking at the impacts of the wind farm on the golden plover. And that's the bird uh, wearing all the colourful bracelets. So like starting back from basics, uh, what do I mean when I talk about shorebirds? So this is a group of birds that are in the kind of taxonomic order Turadiformes. I wish that was easier to say, but it isn't. Um, so in some places, these, this group uh, is also known as waders. And in fact, that's what we call them in the UK. And I think now I've been fully indoctrinated into calling them shorebirds instead. Um, and I forget that I used to call them waders. And I've only been in Trinidad for the last two and a half years, but yeah, I've already learned to start calling them shorebirds. Um, this group of birds are often found close to water, but not always. So some of them don't really associate with water, like some of the dotteral species don't do that. Um, and you often find them on shorelines, hence the name, um, at mudflats, um, by pools and ponds and in wetlands. Um, but when I'm talking about shorebirds in this talk and in this kind of general context of the group of birds, I'm not talking about things like egrets and herons, even though they also kind of wade into the water in the same way. They aren't in this group. So why shorebirds? Um, so this is my personal take on why shorebirds are so great and why I think everyone else should think they're great too. Um, so they're a really diverse um, group and there's lots of interesting species. They fill all sorts of different niches in different ecosystems. Um, and uh, one of the things that they do is make these amazing migratory journeys. So many of the shorebirds we see here in Trinidad um, breed really far north. So some of them breed up in the Arctic and then they travel all the way um, down to uh, the Caribbean and South America to spend the winter where it's warmer. Um, so I quite like them because they're normally quite easy to see. So although um, they can be tricky to identify, um, at least you can see them and they don't normally hide, although they do sometimes. Um, they're a species group that are a really good indicator of what's going on in the wider environment. So because they're quite sensitive to changes in habitat, to maybe changes in climate um, and pollution and loss of things like wetlands, um, they can give us a really good idea if we monitor them of what's, what's happening in the wider environment. And also, um, Kind of related to that, um, lots of these species of shorebirds are declining. So some of them are declining by kind of numbers around kind of 70% um, in terms of population decline. So um, that makes it really important to kind of um, monitor what's going on with them um, and see what's happening and understand how they're using um, space and where the resources are for them. So kind of thinking more about shorebirds in the Caribbean context, so the Caribbean is on this Atlantic flyway and you can see the kind of amazing journeys that I was talking about in these wiggly lines. And you can see also in this map um, that lots of the shorebirds pass by or through the Caribbean on this journey and they do this northwards and um, southwards. Um, so the Caribbean is a really important place for birds to stop and refuel. So not all of them can make like one hop from Canada, say, to South America. Some of them need to stop on the way. And the Caribbean is in a really important place for that kind of stopping off. And here in Trinidad, we're really lucky because we're quite far south in the kind of chain of Caribbean islands and we're near to South America. And it means we get a really nice mix of species here. Um, we get the migratory birds that are just um, passing through, might only be here for a couple of weeks, maybe in the autumn before they head further south. We get birds that will spend the whole winter with us. So they arrive from the north and then just to stay here. And then we have a few species that live in Trinidad all year round and breed here, like um, the southern lapwing, which I'm sure some people will be very familiar with because they're very, very noisy, especially when they're breeding and they can be um, quite aggressive sometimes. So some people know those well. 
So just talking a little bit more about those journeys and thinking specifically about some of the species we see in Trinidad. So this is a ruddy turnstone and they breed in Alaska, in Northern Canada and in Greenland. So just imagine how far they're flying to get here to Trinidad and they're most likely to be seen here in the autumn and then again kind of in early spring. And you find them here in kind of rocky areas and on beaches and piers and jetties and things like that. And then another bird that makes an uh, amazing long distance journey to Trinidad is uh, Western Sandpiper. And these birds are really tiny, so I think it's even more impressive. So they're only kind of 17 centimetres, which is similar to something like a palm tanager. So they're really small birds and they're making these huge journeys. And then these ones will actually spend the whole winter with us on our West Coast mud flats. And then finally, uh, so Leah put this slide together, but I think it's really great because you can see um, several different journeys by several different, um, and this is black belly plover, several different black belly plovers that have been um, satellite tagged so you can trace exactly what their migratory journey was. And I can't pronounce this bird's name, but the bird that uh, Leah was highlighting in this slide is the one in pale blue. And you can see that uh, this particular black belly plover um, flew over 3,000 miles in one journey, um, all the way from kind of northern Canada to South America, which is just so impressive and amazing. Um, and you can see also some of these other birds had to stop in the Caribbean, again, like showing how important it is for shorebirds. So Laura had already mentioned this, so I probably don't need to go into too much more detail, but Back in 2019, um, Birds Caribbean organized this fantastic workshop in Puerto Rico. Um, and I hadn't been in Trinidad long when they announced they were gonna do this. And I was very excited because although I'd worked a lot on shorebirds in the UK, a lot of the species here in Trinidad are new to me. Um, so it was a really fantastic opportunity for me to kind of brush up my ID skills on all these new birds and find out about um, the Caribbean Waterbird Census, which was also something that was new to me. And that's um, um, what it kind of says on the tin. So it's a census of water birds um, throughout the Caribbean. It's a way of counting birds and monitoring them and tracking what's happening. Um, there's a kind of coordinated period from mid uh, January to early February when Birds Caribbean ask people uh, specifically to try and do Caribbean Waterbird Census surveys but you can do them any time of the year and there are kind of different levels of it but at the kind of most uh, simple level it's just about counting all the birds that you see including shorebirds and all the other birds in the wetland you're at um, and recording them um, and putting your data somewhere uh, where it can be on a database so you can enter this data in eBird. Um, so it was really great to go on this workshop meet all these fantastic people Actually, I didn't know Laura very well before we did this. So it was great to meet Laura, even though we were both in Trinidad before, um, and then kind of come together and do this project because off the back of this workshop, Birds Caribbean offered these small grants. And Laura and I thought about what we could do with a small grant here in Trinidad. And so there are two um, important bird areas in Trinidad. So these are areas that are designated by um, BirdLife International. And um, they're kind of, there are important bird areas all around the world in all sorts of different countries. In Trinidad, there are two that are like quite likely to contain lots of water birds and shorebirds and have water birds and shorebirds kind of, they list the species that are likely to be in those areas in the designation. So there's Caroni Swamp, obviously, and the West Coast Mudflats. And the West Coast Mudflats, uh, when you look at a map of this important bird area, is all the way from more or less Port of Spain down to San Fernando. So it's a huge area of muds and it's likely to be quite important to the shorebirds stopping over and spending the winter here in Trinidad because mud is full of food for shorebirds. Um, so we planned to do um, Caribbean waterbird census visits um, on, the, on the West Coast. And so obviously we can really cover the whole of the West Coast. It's a really big area. So we picked three places that we wanted to visit and we chose um, Temple in the Sea and Orange Valley as they're both uh, really good places to see shorebirds and we knew that. And then we also decided that we wanted to try and go to the mud flats that's kind of at the mouth of the Karani River. And to do that, uh, we needed to use a boat. And so that's really part of what the small grant was for. So we were able to kind of hire the boat and do our surveys. 
and then the other part of our project which I'm not going to talk about um, a lot in this talk was kind of doing more public engagement so actually this talk is part of that kind of promise to do public engagement although I'm happy to do it anyway um, but as part of that public engagement we uh, decided we would run a workshop to uh, help people with shorebird ID and talk to them about um, CWC counts um, and also talk to people about counting birds because sometimes it can be a challenge to count quite large groups of birds so we thought it would be useful to kind of give people some hints and tips about counting birds. So our monitoring work was focused on Trinidad's west coast um, we did all our counts around low tide that's what we were aiming for um, when there would be lots of mud for the birds to be feeding on. Um, we also um, kind of aimed to go either early in the morning or late in the afternoon when it was less hot. So that was partly for our own benefit because it gets really very hot out on these mud flats with no shade here. And partly because um, the birds actually hide um, in the mangroves sometimes when it gets very hot. So they don't like it either. So it's good to go when it's a little bit cooler to do these surveys. Um, and we had um, a telescope, which was very kindly given to the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club by Birds Caribbean to assist us in these surveys. We also had binoculars. You can do things like this with a, with a camera and a zoom lens, like in the way you do normal birding. Of course, it's possible. Um, but a scope has some advantages because you can see a little bit further, and I think it's a little bit easier to count the birds when you have a telescope. Um, we also had uh, I don't know if people, hopefully people can see my video, these tally counters. So this is like a little clicky device that adds up the birds and tallies them for you. So if you have um, several hundred birds, it's a really useful thing to have. And uh, our trusty uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Birds of Trinidad and Tobago field guide, which is really useful to double check your bird identification from the field. So I'm now just going to run through um, some of the birds um, we might have expected to see um, on these surveys. Um, so this is by no means all of them, and this absolutely is not all the shorebirds that you might find in Trinidad. Um, we have lots of shorebirds here, and some of them are much more likely to be on freshwater wetlands um, and inland, and even on some kind of farmland areas here in Trinidad. And those are slightly different species often that use those areas. And we also have species that are kind of less common. So they show up um, kind of regularly, but not, not that often um, and not very many of them. And then we have the really rare ones that show up every now and again, and really people get very excited about those ones. So I'm not including those, but I'm including some of the common uh, West Coast shorebird species that we were expecting to see. And as you'll see from my first slide, so there are some amazing photographers here in Trinidad, but I'm not one of them. Um, I don't even really have a proper camera. And I also wanted to illustrate these slides where I'm going to run through some ID features without photographs, because I feel like there are so many more things for shorebirds that help you identify them than just the colours. And I think it, you know, sometimes like a simple sketch like this can maybe help highlight those rather than the really beautiful photos. Um, so this is a ruddy turnstone. It gets its name because, as you can see, it's, it likes to turn stones over. That's what it's supposed to be doing in this picture. Um, so some of the things that help you identify it. Uh, it has got bright orange legs, so that is a colour thing. Um, that's something to look out for, and they're quite short. And um, they tend to be kind of crouched down, as you can sort of see in this picture. They've got these pointy wedge-shaped beaks that you can see here. They often have kind of black black patches kind of on their chest and sometimes on their face and that varies through the year and through the winter so it, they often start off with lots of black on them and then end up looking very brown um, and the, the feathers on their back and wings can be quite rufousy coloured but again they kind of change to brown so one of the things about shorebirds is they molt between breeding and spending the winter somewhere so they have these kind of um, more brightly coloured plumages in the breeding season and as they pass through in the autumn some birds will still have some of those feathers and some of them uh, won't and some of them will be somewhere in between so that's another reason why colours can be a little bit confusing with these birds. Um, these um, uh, turnstones also have this really distinctive stripy pattern on their backs and wings when they fly and that's a really good 
um, indicator of what species it is. There aren't really any other birds in Trinidad that are going to look stripy like this um, when they fly away. There are others that have black and white patterns, but not the streaky stripy ones like this one. And turnstones, these are great because they have so many things that help you identify them. They also have a very distinctive call, which I hope you'll be able to hear when I play it. So I hope people can hear that. Um, nothing else sounds like that either. So if you hear that noise, you know you've got turnstones around. And the next bird is another easy one. Um, this is a wimbrel. Um, you can tell it's a wimbrel because it's quite big. Um, it's got this really long down curved beak and none of the other birds that are kind of common on the west coast in Trinidad are going to have this long down curved beak. And you can see it's got kind of stripes on the head and through the eye um, and it has very long legs. And these birds also have quite a distinctive call, they kind of make a bubbling call. So hopefully you can hear that. Okay, <laughs> and then moving on to another species. This is a red knot. Um, this gets its name from when it's in its breeding plumage. So this is quite confusing because when we see it here in Trinidad, it's definitely not red really. I mean, sometimes it has little patches of rufous feathers left and some of them can look kind of pinky red, sometimes in the autumn early on, but generally they look quite gray. And I'm gonna say that this species is um, kind of identifiable in its kind of lack of outstanding features. So it's medium sized, it has medium length legs, it has a medium length beak and it's kind of gray all over. So, kind of all of those things combined kind of help you pick it out because it's kind of this medium size bird with a medium sized beak and it's quite nondescript and just gray looking. It also kind of looks quite plump. So it has this kind of slightly barrel chest. So they're kind of easy to pick out that way. I wouldn't say that the calls are especially useful for red knot, but if you get close to them, you might hear them kind of chattering amongst the people, making these little noises. I guess that can help. I'm not going to be like very distinct. So moving on, this is another species that's named for its kind of breeding season plumage. I know this actually is a grey plover. This is the same species of plover that we get in the UK as well. So it's got a really wide distribution, this species. Um, when we see it in Trinidad, it's grey and mottled. Um, it can have um, some black still on its belly. Um, it has a short stubby beak. And the whole bird is kind of skittle shaped or kind of um, tempin bowling pin um, shaped, I think. Um, that's a good kind of indicator. And this one has like a particular behavior where it kind of, kind of, kind of, I think kind of stomps, it kind of struts across the mud and stops to pick up food and then looks up and kind of walks a bit more. And it tends to be on its own. So even if there are other black belly plovers around, they're kind of very spread out. And um, it also has a real giveaway when it flies. It has these kind of black. Um, wing pits, armpits kind of inside the wing and they're really obvious and it has a distinctive call so it makes a really sad whistle. That's a kind of nice ID feature. Now we have a couple of species that are a little bit difficult to identify or tell the difference between the greater and lesser yellow legs. So they both got yellow legs as a clue in the name and they're grey and mottled um, and you'll likely find both of them in kind of mud flats and in the rice fields here in Trinidad. So how do you tell the difference between them? It should be pretty obvious which one's which, so the greater is bigger and the lesser is smaller. If you see them together it's normally easy to tell who's who, but also thinking about the greater yellow legs, so as well as being bigger and it kind of looks chunkier generally, it has a longer beak which is sometimes slightly upturned, and if you imagine kind of sliding the beak backwards to, into the head, that sounds a bit gruesome, um, the beak is, is longer than the depth of the head. So if you imagine kind of taking the beak and laying it against the head, uh, it would stick out behind. Whereas the lesser yellow legs, the beak is like a similar length to the depth of the head. And they have different calls as well. So that is helpful. So the greater yellow legs. Loud and strident and often three or four notes. And then the lesser yellow legs is slightly softer, often just peep peep, and sometimes kind of peep 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 peep, peep like constantly. But it's kind of a softer sound, um, it's slightly different. 
And then we have a semi palmated plover. Um, and these guys have orangey legs, an orangey uh, beak with a black tip, and they have this distinctive kind of collar around their neck. Um, so they're a relatively easy species to identify. They're kind of um, small and kind of fat looking, like a bit like the other plover, but even more kind of squashed down and plump looking. Um, and they're kind of brown on the back. And then these guys, which are the really challenging ones, so these two, uh, we kind of, they come in a group of kind of birds that we are small sandpipers. So that's the type of bird they are. Um, birders will call them peeps and there are other ones as well. There are more than one, two species of peep. Um, but these are the ones you're most likely to see on the West Coast and they're very similar to each other. They're gray and they have black beaks and black legs. And I've exaggerated a little bit in this doodle um, so the western sandpiper has a longer and slightly down curved beak and the semi palmated sandpiper has a shorter and straighter beak but it's often very hard to tell the difference between them uh, when they're far away um, and they're feeding in the mud so their beaks are down in the mud so we struggle with that in some of our surveys as you'll see um, but I think hopefully that you'll think some of the species are relatively easy to pick out from the crowd even if all of them aren't. And there are more, but I haven't got time to go through all of them. I've probably done too many already. Um, I could just go on and on about all the different species, um, but that's not really everything that this talk is about today. There's a bunch of other ones that we saw and uh, you're likely to see fairly often, especially during migration. So willet, um, short-billed dow, which are two that are very likely to be here kind of just during kind of autumn and maybe spring migration. And then kind of things like black neck stilt, southern lapwing and column plover might be here all year round. So you can see those at any time if you're out on the west coast. So to, moving back to our surveys. So I'm going to run through what we did in our monitoring. So here at Karani River Mouth, and um, this is what we did to get to the mud flat. So the three of the four surveys we did, we started at Karani Swamp and took the boat through the swamp and kind of headed north towards the mud. And then for one of them, we went down the Karani River and I'll explain more about why we decided to do that as I go through explaining what we did. And um, there are only three routes on here, but we did do four surveys. And then just a bit more zoomed in. So you can see the kind of patch of mud where the Karani River mouth empties out into the Gulf of Paria. And that's what we were interested in. And so, um, as we did our first survey, um, we planned it so that we would be there at low tide. It was meant to be like one of the lowest uh, low tides of the year. Um, so we thought there should be lots of mud. Um, we were looking forward to seeing what birds there might be out there. And we saw some beautiful scarlet ibis fly over as we headed through the swamp. Um, and this is us just getting to the um, opening out into the gulf, um, just about to see what's going on. And then as we kind of rounded out through the mangrove and started heading north towards where the mudflat was going to be, we just kind of were, were greeted with water, kind of water, water everywhere, um, which wasn't what we were expecting. Um, and it's very confusing and we didn't know why and we still don't really understand why. I did check and I did get the low tide time right that day. Um, but yeah, there was lots of water, um, and not as much mud as we thought there would be. Uh, but we did eventually get close enough to this um, area. So this is like a little bit of um, newly growing mangrove. So this is a mud flat at the mouth of the river with some mangroves growing on it. And there's mud around that. You can't quite see it in this picture, but there is mud around that. So we did manage to count some birds in that survey, even though we had very odd conditions and not quite what we were expecting. And we saw quite a lot of the uh, semi-palmated plovers on this survey. So that was really nice. It was good to know there were shorebirds using the mud and there was mud to see birds on. And there's quite a lot of mangrove, maybe more than I was expecting. Um, and then, yeah, that's another view. So that's with our lovely scope um, in a rain shower, uh, which was actually very welcome because it was quite hot. And then we did another survey that was very similar. So we managed, there was a bit more mud this time. Um, it wasn't uh, quite so strange. Um, we counted lots of birds. We kind of beached the boat here on the mud to be able to count the birds. That's just us checking our lists, probably, and making sure we've counted everything before we head back. But one of the issues we encountered doing these surveys was that, you know, we were hoping we'd head out into the Gulf of Paria, we'd be able to kind of cruise up to the mud flat, 
do a count on one side and then because there's this big bit of mangrove in the middle kind of head round the other side count that um this is what we were expecting here's laura on the boat holding onto the scope as we kind of head out into the water in the boats but actually what happened quite a lot uh was this um so the water's very very shallow um, of course and as you get closer and closer to the mud flats it gets more and more shallow and so every time we kind of did these surveys um, in the first couple of visits we just got stuck in the mud and this is Darren our amazing the guy in the hat is Darren Madhu he's the amazing guy whose boat we used who drove the boat who uh, helped us with the kind of survey logistics and helped us with the surveys because he's quite a good birder um, and this is them pushing us out the mud um, we did offer to help but they didn't want us to um, so it's a bit tricky and sometimes we got really stuck and couldn't get out the mud at all and had to wait for the tide to come in which could be a little bit frustrating when you know you want to go around and count the birds on the other side so then Darren came up with a plan he suggested that what we should try and do is bring some kayaks with us uh, the next time we did a survey so this would be the third survey we did and see if we could paddle uh, a bit closer and count the birds on the mud. So it sounded like a great idea. And so that's what we did. And it seemed like it would be a really great idea. But, and this is us in the kayak and me counting some birds. But actually, we're not as close as we might have wanted. You see, you can probably tell in that photo that the mud is still a little bit far away. And what you can't really see in this photo is that we're actually grounded on the mud here. So you can see in Laura's paddle, there's kind of mud all over it. And we've been kind of punting our way through. So pushing the paddle down into the mud to use, kind of push ourselves forward into the mud as we went. Um, and yeah, we couldn't quite get as close as we might have wanted. It was close enough, but it would have been nice to get a bit closer. Um, so that was like a, a still a bit of a challenge and we kind of got muddy and wet, um, but it was fun. And we kind of paddled out and paddled back again to the boat and then kind of went around the other side to count the birds. But it wasn't uh, as successful as we might have hoped. So that's when Darren suggested that maybe we should just head down the Carony River so he could borrow a boat because he keeps his boat in Carony Swamp. So he could borrow a boat and we could take the boat down the Carony River and access the mud flat directly that way. So that's what we did on the very last survey, which was just before the kind of COVID lockdown. Um, so it kind of the whole COVID thing has curtailed our work a little bit because we were supposed to do another survey after that, which we've never done. But anyway, oh, okay, I'd forgotten about this. So I made a short video while we're out on one of the surveys, which I'll play a little bit of. So this is us heading away from our mud flat. And we finished our survey, so we're going north and then we're gonna loop background so we're trying to avoid the shallow water here. See some uh, great white egrets there. You can see how close we were to the port of Spain. There's a clear pelican flying faster. Um, head away from the mangrove and the mud flat and on our way home. And then yeah here's a nice picture just showing like how close we got to Port of Spain some of the time in our surveys. So these mud flats are kind of, you know, very close to kind of fairly urban areas. And then this is the final survey where we went out onto the mud flats at Carony um, from Carony River. Um, we did this in the evening as well instead of early in the morning because we were finding a lot of the birds were still hiding in the mangroves even quite early in the morning. Yeah, and this seemed really successful. Like it was raining a little bit and quite cold. Um, which was great actually, um, it meant all the birds were out. Um, so we beached the boat up on the mud and I've got out the boat. I was very pleased that actually the mud wasn't very um, soft. Uh, so I didn't sink in completely because I've had some interesting experiences before on mud flats where um, things have got a lot more sticky than this. Um, so yeah, this was great and this worked really well. And you might be able to see there are some shorebirds in this photo, the, the tiny little dots in the kind of long strip of water in front of me those are kind of uh, probably western sandpipers i think um so that worked uh, pretty well so we worked that one out right at the end when we pretty much done all the surveys but still it was fun working it out and these are some of the birds that we saw so every single time we went we saw lots of semi-palmated plovers and that very last visit we had a really high count of those tiny semi-palmated and western sandpipers 
And some of those were definitely Western sandpipers because they were closer to me um, and I could identify them positively, but a lot of the birds were quite far away and I couldn't get close to them without disturbing everything. So I, I only have those down to one or other of those two species, but overall it means there are over a thousand of those small sandpipers using that mud flat on that visit, which is quite a lot of birds. And I'll just quickly run through some of the visits to the other sites that people maybe are a bit more familiar with. So the other two places we did our surveys were at Temple in the Sea or by the Sea, I can never work out which one it is, and Orange Valley. So here's the temple. This is a time actually when there were some American flamingos visiting and we counted kind of from the temple. Yeah, so here's Laura and I counting some birds on the mud flat next to the temple. It was a beautiful place to do bird surveys. Um, and then we kind of walked south along the mud flat there. So some people will be familiar with this as a birding spot. Um, so this is looking north back towards the temple and we were counting the birds on the mud all along there. Um, and then looking south towards Orange Valley, so we counted birds up to the spit you can see kind of at the, in this photo sticking out. And yeah, in a temple in the sea, we saw like a really high diversity, so the counts weren't as high here, but like especially in the autumn, there were lots of different species, so it's a lovely site to go to see all your different species. It was a great place to practice bird identification. Um, yeah, and it's much more diverse maybe than the Karani River mouth was. And you'll see Orange Valley also didn't have this many species. But obviously, this is just one year worth of surveys with like five visits. So I think we'd need to carry on doing these surveys and find out if um, this site's always got lots more species or whether we just happen to come on days when there are lots of species there. Um, so this is at Orange Valley. So this is down south from the Temple in the Sea, and we were standing on the pier. Uh, so the fisher boats are all kind of tied up along here um, at Orange Valley. And this is, yeah, the mud flat by the mangrove, which is there at low tide. So there's not really any mud there once the tides come in. And then looking south, there's quite a big mud flat, and some of that always seems to be fairly uncovered. Um, and here's Mark looking at the birds. This is post COVID. So this is a more recent survey, uh, Mark's wearing his mask. And I don't know if you can see, but on the mud here, there's lots of tiny little white dots and those were Western and semi-palmated sandpipers. And we had over 600 of them in this count. Um, so this is like a really nice place to see kind of larger numbers maybe of shorebirds. And here's some of the results. So as you can see, there weren't as many species, um, but we did get a few high counts of some of them. Um, so yeah, kind of interesting variation between the sites, but maybe um, can't read too much into that just now based on this number of surveys, but it's an interesting thing to carry on looking at. Um, so we've done these surveys over the year. Um, so we finished doing the kind of surveys officially for the project in kind of springtime, but we've carried on um, since COVID restrictions were lifted, um, keeping on counting at Temple in the Sea in Orange Valley. We can't get to Karani without going in a boat, so we haven't been able to do that. Um, and we're also planning to carry on trying to count other places like Karani rice fields, which is great for shorebirds, and maybe some of the wetlands close to Karani swamp. And as part of the project, we want to encourage other people to join in um, and do CWC counts or um, put their data in when they're in uh, when they're birding, um, actually enter their, their bird list as CWC counts. Um, because the more people who do that, the better. Um, and even if it's the same sites we're already counting at, that's fine. So the more times these sites get counted, um, the better. And we can kind of understand like how the birds are using them. And actually that leads on to our workshop. So I know I wasn't gonna talk about this much, so I'm just gonna mention it. Um, so we did this in March again, just before all the COVID lockdown. And we just talked to people about ID and counting. Um, and there were lots of people there. I was really pleased like how many people came. Um, we had a really nice day and we didn't have huge numbers of shorebirds, but we did have one huge flock of over 3000 laughing gulls so people could practice their counting on those. Yeah, and it was uh, really nice to talk to people about shorebirds, um, CWC and um, kind of surveying and counting shorebirds on that day. So just uh, want to talk a little bit about um, why 
my counting counts. So that bit of my talk title about making counts count. Um, so the more times you kind of um, record these shorebirds uh, and count them, um, you get the better idea you get of the different types of shorebirds that are using different locations and different habitats. So here in Trinidad, you know, we've already maybe got some indication that different types of birds are using those three sites differently. Um, and if we do more surveys, we'll get a better idea of that. Um, by doing surveys, you can find out um, what time of year um, the birds start arriving and leaving again, and if that changes between years, or if there's a, you have lots of years of data, you can see if there's a change over time. Um, you can keep an eye out. So if you're there kind of regularly at your patch, at your wetland, you can keep an eye out um, for any potential threats to the birds or the habitats they're in. Um, it's kind of maybe an early warning that um, things might change or there's something you want to act on or talk to people about. Um, and kind of notice just changes in the environments, so maybe not um, threats, but kind of any pollution happening. That is a threat, I guess. Um, any kind of changes to the way the birds are using the environment or changes in where the best uh, mud patches are or, or where the best feeding places are. And all of this kind of gives you like a, uh, a baseline of kind of uh, the types of birds that are there and the abundance of the birds, um, which can be a really great reference point uh, for any future change generally. So how they're being affected by perhaps things like climate change over a long time period, um, or just general kind of um, trends in uh, birds numbers and bird species. But also it can be really useful if something unexpected happens. So um, just plucking a completely random example, if there was a gulf, if there was an oil spill in the Gulf of Paria, um, it would be really um, useful to have a baseline of how the wetland birds were using the swamp and the mudflats before that happened to see uh, what happens afterwards. So sometimes you can't predict that these things are going to happen, but if you have the baseline already, it's really great. And a big plug uh, to Jessica. Uh, so I just think this is a really great example, uh, the paper that Jessica Kenyera has published recently on like how these types of um, data can just be used uh, quite powerfully to show how important some areas are for shorebirds. So this is uh, her paper where she used data from eBird, uh, from CWC surveys to highlight important areas for shorebirds across the Caribbean. So it's just amazing that like all the data that people have been collecting has now been able to be used to, um, to show that some areas are really important that we didn't know about before. So there's always a bigger picture with this stuff. So uh, just some tips on how you might want to contribute if you wanted to get involved. So first of all, like going birding in a wetland is a great thing to do. Um, you can start learning uh, shorebirds if you don't know them already. Um, and putting data in eBird is great. So if people aren't familiar with eBird, it's like an online um, site which has loads of information about birds, but you can also enter lists of birds you've seen at particular sites. And if you have a list that is um, a complete list, so you've recorded everything that you've seen, and you've got a reasonably, you've got an accurate count of everything you've seen, uh, and you're in a wetland, and you're using the Caribbean portal of eBird, then actually you've already done a CWC count. Um, so if you go and enter your data, um, you can choose observation type and put in CWC instead of traveling counts or stationary counts, depending on which one you've, you've done. So for some people, it's not a big change to do uh, a CWC count because uh, although there are other levels of it, there are more complicated ways of doing CWC counts. The kind of less complicated way, the most basic one, is just counting all the birds you've seen, um, recording every species you've seen, and entering the data in eBird um, using one of these observation types. So you can find out more about CWC at Birds Caribbean website. And also Birds Caribbean have some great resources. So they've got this lovely Caribbean shorebirds ID guides. And obviously not all of these are shorebirds that might be in Trinidad, but I think nearly most of them are. Um, and then I've got another section, which is things I was talking about, like kind of size and shape and beak length and behavior. And those are all on the Birds Caribbean website. And I find this um, Cornell All About Birds site really useful because um, you can, look up birds on there if you're not sure about identification and I think they've got some really good photos and they show you similar species so it's a good place to look if you're not sure and here in Trinidad we're really lucky that we have the 
the bird alert email list, um, which you can look, get access, where you can try and you can sign up to. And you go by the TTF and we see website. I think there's a link where you could uh, sign up for that list. But you can post photos on there if you're not sure what bird you've seen. And people are really, really helpful in helping people identify species. So <laughs> finally, I hope people have been paying attention. I'm not sure how this is going to work because I can't see um, the chat box, but maybe I can make it so that I can. Or maybe someone else is just going to have to tell me what answers people are giving because I don't think I can see. Yeah, no problem. I could um, chime in and hope you'll Okay. Do that. I mean, I, it says chat, but I can't see it. So you just have to tell me what people are saying. <laughs> so if people can remember my earlier slides, or already know this. So uh, which uh, migratory shorebird is in this photo? They're all the same species. Okay, so far, Amy said Wimrel. Mm -hmm. Any more answers? Yes, yes Jerome, you all can play. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jerome can't play. He's too good. <laughs> um, he, can, he can play. <laughs> Thoreau said Wimbrels as well. Uh-huh. Okay. So this one's, yeah. I mean, Thoreau Thoreau said blue. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, a nice easy one. Um, but yeah, like they're they're a lovely species to identify as like a if you're a beginner shorebirder because they've got this really distinctive beak and they're so big. Okay, now slightly harder, well, slightly harder, at least one of them slightly harder. So first of all, um, which bird is this one? The one that Arrow's pointing out. Okay, we have Ruddy Turnstone from Javon. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Amy said Turnstone as well. Okay, Andre guessed the other bird, but I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Not <guess>. yet. <laughs> Furrow said Ruddy Turnstone. Yeah, okay. So yes, it's Ruddy Turnstone. And then this last one maybe is a bit more challenging. Well, the last picture ID maybe it's a bit more challenging although Leah has given you a big clue in the question <laughs> okay crystal said greater yellow leg uh, mm -hmm. Quincy hi Quincy Quincy said lesser yellow leg okay so who's Quincy right greater yellow legs question mark okay so um, it's actually um, lesser yeah. so it's not you kind of got the turnstone next to it as like a little bit of a reference point. Um, so it's not huge compared to turnstone. Um, and the beak is kind of straight looking and quite delicate looking and it's a similar kind of length to the depth of the head. And then finally, there's two more, um, guess the sounds. These should be um, kind of, I think they're not too hard, we'll see. I'm going to play it again in case people want to hear it twice. Okay, Farah said lesser yellow leg. <laughs> Any more guesses? Lisa says greater yellow leg. Mm -hmm. Farazmo says all greater. He can't remember. <laughs> Jason says greater. Mm -hmm. Faraz says he's going to go with greater now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Renoir says definitely not a frog. <laughs> oh, it's not a frog, Renoir. Sorry, was, there are no frogs in this talk. If it was frogs, Renoir would get all of these. Uh, Elizabeth so, says Lassa. Jerome says greater. Okay. So I've revealed the birds. We have a mixture still. So. Yeah, so it's greater. 
So it's the kind of strident call with kind of three notes kind of quite separately. So that's kind of the giveaway there. And actually you can see it was, uh, the difference between this bird and the lesser yellow legs in the previous photo with the kind of much longer beak and kind of it looks a bit chunkier. Okay. One more. We have a guest from Amy. She says Wimbro. Wait for the other guesses. Okay. Uh, Stephanie says Wimbro. Aquila says Wimbro. Chantel says Wimbro. <laughs> Jerome agrees. Oh, I'm kind of wishing now I'd like just put a different picture up and pretended it was something else. But yeah, it's the Wimbro. So that's the end of the quiz and it's the end of my talk. So big thanks to Laura um, for being my partner in crime in all the monitoring. Big thanks to Darren Madhu, who was just great at taking us out on the boats and pushing us out the mud when we got stuck. And Mark Hume, who helps us with the surveys, Aaliyah for the slides, um, TTF and C for kind of facilitating the project, and Birds Caribbean for making our project happen and giving us the small grants and running the workshop, which was really great. So yeah, thanks to everyone. And thanks to everyone for listening for so long. <laughs>